Hello, beautiful soul, and welcome back to the James Zander Trip, where we dive into psychedelics, spirituality, the power of the mind, the mysteries of reality, and how we can tune into the highest timeline for ourselves. In today's episode, we're going to explore mushrooms, ayahuasca, DMT, consciousness, the true nature of reality, and also relationships, love, navigating life, and following the breadcrumbs of synchronicity. Join me today is a transformation coach, cosmic traveler, consciousness explorer, psychedelic adventurer, and my good friend, Sky Blue. Sky, welcome to the show. Mm, thank you. So glad to be here. So happy to have you. Sky, you were integral in the beginnings of my psychedelic explorations. On July 7th, 2018, <laughs> you gave me a weed edible. A THC edible, <laughs> which was a very gentle, light, buzzy experience that nevertheless rocked my world. And the reason it rocked my world is because it was the first time where my consciousness was shifted. It wasn't shifted a lot, that was going to come later with LSD and mushrooms and DMT, but it was shifted just enough to let me know that there was more to reality than meets the eye and that there were possibilities waiting for me on the other side of this metaphorical door, the doors of perception. That little weed edible, although it technically isn't a psychedelic, started this whole journey of shifting my consciousness. Uh, so thank you for the weed edible. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, five years later, still tripping, <laughs> still exploring reality. <laughs> and I might actually add a little bit to that particular episode because it was not planned. It was actually super synchronistic because um, I spent some time in Seattle and uh, that was the first time when I encountered these new stores that uh, were selling edibles. And so I tried it, but I tried only half of it and then I kept the other half in my pocket and I completely forgot about it. And then, it just so happened then some days later when you and I were in Vancouver meeting up for the first time, I just reached out into my, into my back pocket and there it was. And I was like, oh, here you go. And so so I didn't even orchestrate it, but uh, I think the universe had some plans for you already at that time. <laughs> it, was, it was a beautiful synchronicity. I mean, it opened up so much. Do you recall that day? I mean, I must have, I think I recall being nervous around taking it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, you were nervous and you were like, like, what, what is this stuff? Like, is this drugs? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and I'm like, no, like, it's, you know, just try it, like experiment, see, see, see what it does. And you're like, famous last words, okay. just try okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I remember, um, we continued to talk and continued to uh, take this beautiful, beautiful stroll along the uh, the harbor uh, in Vancouver. And at one point you're like, oh, like, I feel different. I feel more relaxed. I feel as if like some sort of this background noise that was present is kind of gone. And I'm like, oh, like you, you were not high by any means, but you were like, I feel different. So that part I remember vividly. And I'm like, okay, there you go. First experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was it was beautiful. It was exactly what I needed. Just gentle enough, but strong enough to to show me there's more to to life. Do you recall what your first experience was of having your consciousness shifted in some way? <laughs> I do. <laughs> and um for me, it was my first experience of ayahuasca, uh, meaning that um, I have not explored anything at all in my life up until that point. And um, I remember thinking that, okay, I've been on the path of spiritual development for so many years. And and I'm not, I'm not quite having the experiences that I think I I'm supposed to be having so like I need some sort of kick I need some sort of crack in my consciousness to to shift and and start feeling something else and uh, initially I explored the possibility of um, mushrooms and actually 
I looked into growing mushrooms and uh, uh, everything that's involved in that process, but that was you know quite an endeavor. And then um, somehow the topic of ayahuasca popped up. A friend went down to Peru uh, some months prior, and um, and I was like, oh, that is definitely something to explore. And literally two or three weeks later, many things converged. I actually got let go from my current uh, job. Um, and um, I was like, okay, I'm going on a trip. So I booked tickets to Peru, to the Amazon jungle. And I connected with a beautiful uh, um, bunch of people that were organizing and holding the space. And I had my first five ayahuasca ceremonies deep in the jungle of Amazon. And to answer your question specifically, like, do I remember the first time my consciousness shifted? Very vividly. It was... um, it was this um, opening into the world of Pandora at night. There I was in the Maloka, in the, in the deep jungle of Amazon, and it felt as if jungle kind of moved in and embraced me and opened me up into these beautiful colors, like you know the luminescent colors of Pandora at night. And then I just started to smile because up to that point I was like, is anything going to happen? Like, am I going to... Like, like <laughs> feel anything, <laughs> and I just smiled. And then they actually got up, and I went and laid in the hammock. And I think for the rest of the night, I was just feeling the love pouring from the jungle towards me, and seeing all the colors, and just being one. And I even remember that at some point, the jungle sort of like gently consumed and devoured me, and I kind of, for for some time, dissolved and sort of became one with it. So Uh, that was my first experience. Wow, 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 wow. That sounds so beautiful and uh, brings me back to my own memories of ayahuasca. So cool. Do you remember the first night right before you took that first sip of ayahuasca? How, How were you feeling? What was your intention at that moment? Was there a sense of nervousness and... And how surprised were you by what happened that first night? Hmm. Yeah, I remember that the predominant train of thoughts that I had was like, is anything going to happen? Because I had this story that I'm so grounded, so in the material, so in the mind that I'm going to drink it and I'm not going to feel anything. Like... And so it wasn't exactly nervousness about what's going to happen. Um, like, am I going to um, feel something strange? It was more the other way. It's like, is it going to be strong enough to like punch through the the coating of my <laughs> mentality and uh, and have an effect? And I also remember that at least that particular brew of ayahuasca was probably the most unusual terrible taste I've ever I've ever had <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean they all differ now I know uh-huh. as far as the brews but that particular one I was like whoa what was that <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the other four nights of ceremonies what do you recall about them and what did they teach you hmm. it was fascinating because they were all different I remember one uh, I think it was my either the second or the third one, where right after drinking ayahuasca and receiving the Icarus uh, from the shaman, um, I completely blacked out. And the only thing that I remembered is me being the point of awareness, coming back into the body. And it was this interesting perspective of seeing the body, not seeing the head, seeing the the neck and sort of the opening of the neck and me sort of climbing back in and doing a, a check. Okay, okay, so this is the body of this guy. Okay, he's got kids. Okay, he's like, he's from there. They're like, like okay, 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 I'm in the right, I'm in the right body. And then, <laughs> and that's it. So that was actually the, the shortest trip I probably had ever. Like I, I remembered absolutely nothing, just the point of return from somewhere. I don't even know where I was, um, but that particular 
episode <laughs> was wow. interesting. Yeah, so that was one of the trips. Um, another trip was me trying to meet up with my higher self. At the time, I remember, I remember it was such an idea, such a, such a goal of like, oh, I want to make contact with my higher self somehow and i don't know receive some some wisdoms and direction and um maybe a more clarity about where i want to go next in my life so and then that particular trip i i was still in malocca and you know the the the, the round building uh, in the jungle and i felt the presence of my higher self yet I could not see their face. I only saw the mask and also them like hiding behind different posts and like these walls. And I was like, hey, can we sit down and have a conversation? And my higher self was just kind of like lurking in the dark, uh, sort of in the background. And I never got a chance to actually sit down and connect, but I remember spending a lot of that trip just kind of chasing my higher self and trying to connect. <laughs> What do you what do you think that symbolizes? What what did you make of that? Hmm, at the time, I was kind of peeved. I'm like, hey, like, dude, like <laughs> this is this is you know this is my chance to connect with you, and you're like hiding. Uh, but in retrospect, um, it it kind of seems as if what was happening at the time was what was needed, meaning to just open up gently and receive the medicine and allow it to percolate and not necessarily jump straight into achieving some sort of objectives, you know, receiving some sort of, um, you know, advice or, or whatever it is that I was hoping to receive. And that's what that whole week in the jungle ended up being for me, is just being received very gently, very mm -hmm. tenderly, very motherly-like by the medicine and opening up my heart and and preparing me for what's next. And what was next? <laughs> I remember at the very last ceremony, at the fifth ceremony, I started to feel like my my sexual energy was, was starting to build up. Like I, for the first time probably in my life, I started to feel like this buzz um, in in the area at the bottom of my spine where you could say that you know the root chakra is. And I was like, huh, what's going on? And uh, as part of our preparations for the ceremonies, they advised us not to have sex, not to masturbate, uh, not to have any anything to do with sexuality uh, for a week prior, and then obviously not during the, uh, the ceremonies. So I think it had something to do with that. But what really came next, I was not prepared for because... Once I was complete in the jungle and uh, left for the sacred valley, Cusco and Pisac, through a friend, I connected with a beautiful space holder and facilitator by the name of Miguel, who invited me after a conversation, actually. I remember he met me at the airport and he, he brought me from Cusco to Pisac. And on the way, he was kind of probing me and asking me some questions to see if I'm ready. And da, 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 da. and finally, he's like, yes, in uh, two days, I'm doing a nighttime ceremony with Huachuma, San Pedro cactus. Mm. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Um, and he explained it to me. I'm like, okay, I'm open to that. So it was, I think it was Wednesday night when we, when a group of us gathered in his backyard and sat down around the fire and gently eased into the ceremony and drank the Wachuma tea. It's essentially um, kind of like a gelatinous um, drink. And um, probably not even uh, one hour into the ceremony, I started to feel that energy rise again, the, the, the energy of the sexual charge show up. And then I started going through this, through these massive temperature changes. I, I started to get super hot. Then I started to get super cold. And then my body started to shake. And um, probably after another hour, what started to happen is that I started to feel the energy 
beginning to circulate from the base chakra up the spine all the way to my head and then down and just in a circle, in a circle, in a circle, ever increasing to the point that then I started to feel as if I'm having an orgasm, except it would never stop. It would, it lasted for some hours. Wow. And during those hours, I'd say six or seven hours, I was like grasping for the, for the grass and just like orienting myself towards the fire, listening to the, to the medicine songs and just like, like really out of my wits. I, I did not know what was happening. It, it <laughs> literally like just cracked me open. And uh -huh. I was looking at the sky, I was looking at the moon, I was looking at the stars, at the fire, and on and on and on and on, while this energy circulated. As I later described, the way it felt as if I was making love to all the, all the women in the world at the same time. Like, that's how intense it was. <laughs> and then in the morning, once, once everything kind of started to subside, I was still quite shaky. In a, and I remember asking Miguel, I'm like, am I going to be... Okay, am I going to be right? Is like, is it, is it, is it, is it like what happened? And he was just like, yeah, whatever, whatever happened, that's what you needed. And only like a couple of days later, after processing what happened and connecting the dots, I realized that what likely has happened it, uh, is that the, it was like a spontaneous Kundalini energy awakening facilitated by the medicine. And, um, and that was the beginning of something that is uh, still with me today, something that I continue to work with. It's been six years now. Mm. And um, it's very much, it was very much a turning point in my life that sent me uh, uh, the pa down the path that, that I'm on right now. You still feel it to this day, this awakening? The way it works now is that like over the years, after after those experiences, whenever I worked with different medicines like mushrooms or uh, even cannabis or bufo or ayahuasca, inevitably something similar happens. However, over the years, it expanded. And the sense that I have is that with each and every ceremony, it, my electric system, my energetic system gets worked up to a slightly higher level from where it was before it's almost as if my pipes are being primed to be able to handle more and more electricity and energy volume with each ceremony mm, wow. and not only with the medicine now it's actually happening quite often when i simply work with the uh, tantric practices of opening the kundalini energy and simply being in a ceremony with another human being in front of me without any medicine can you talk a little bit about the tantric practices because i don't know enough about it hmm. yeah I think it's important to say right away that there's a lot of controversy around the word even Tantra these days because so many people picked it up and ran away with it simply in the context of uh, having sex in particular ways. So when people hear Tantra, they equal in their mind, equal that with, in their mind with sex. And while opening up the sexual energy, the kundalini energy is important in tantric practices. The sex part may or may not happen ever. So these practices uh, in the traditions that I've been trained in primarily involve different kinds of um, yoga, you would say. So there is... Um, Tantra Kriya Yoga, which involves a specific kind of breath work, basically, that opens up the energy and like really kicks it up and pff, your heart opens, your energy opens, and you just connect uh, with other people in bliss and pleasure in a circle. So then there is a couple exercises, typically between the uh, Shakti and Shiva energies, that are represented by a woman and a man. However, those energies are within us uh, regardless of the uh, specific gender. And um, 
There is also Venus Kriyas, which involve different kinds of energy flowing exercises uh, when in, in couples. And there are rituals as well that honor the, the sacred sexuality in a ritualistic form that um, prepares couples, if they so desire, to, to then transition into a sexual act. So this is like a, a very brief overview. But it helps to think about the ancient traditions of Tantra as simply yogic uh, practices that, that are aimed to open up your energy, get it flowing and flowing and flowing, open up your heart, get you connected, and, and really open you up into pleasure mm. of, of being with other humans. The sky blue that went into the jungle and the sky blue that came out of the jungle after the five ceremonies plus San Pedro, how did it shift you fundamentally forever? In, in which ways would you say you were shifted? Mm. I don't think I was aware at the time that the shift has occurred. Mm. Uh, because it was the events of the of the next few months that really defined the shift. I ended up um, separating from my partner at the time, moving out, and then kind of embarking on this grand adventure that I'm still on to this day. <laughs> but um, I think what it did is uh, simply initiated me into what's possible. And... To this day, I don't even know what, what that is. All I know that it has to do with flowing my energy freely, with keeping my heart open, and taking the steps that I feel are most aligned at each and every moment. So it was just like this welcoming, welcoming into the next part of my life that happened in the jungle at that time. And uh, it only in, in retrospect, I could connect the dots, you know, as Steve Jobs famously said. <laughs> so, yeah. What I love about your story is you intended to have a crack of, you know, an energetic crack in your system to show you what's possible. And the plant medicines delivered. I find that is one of the many, many benefits of psychedelics is they they create these spaces of possibility of like, oh, there's a whole other world here. There's a whole other frequency here. Yeah. Yes. And the mystery of it is, is with me every time I go into a ceremony. It's, it's, you know, there's more questions every time than answers. However, the beauty, the mystery and the, the healing that seems to arrive with each ceremony is so precious. Have you had any recent experiences that have have uh, expanded the journey? Yes, it's interesting that this year has been a year when pretty much six years to the date, after I did my first five ayahuasca ceremonies, I reopened that container. I have not I have not sat with ayahuasca for for six years. And it's this April, six years after the April of 2017, when I first sat with Ayahuasca, that I reopened that container. And um, I felt as if I am being initiated into the next big thing that has to do with me really stepping up to the stage of life and showing up showing up in different ways, um, showing up as a space holder. After my first ceremony with um, with Bufo, I was so inspired to connect with other men that I started holding space for uh, a men's circle weekly in Playa del Carmen. And it's still going to this uh, date. And... Um, Another major thing that has happened over the past 
few months and a few ceremonies with ayahuasca is this direct experience of what I call, I, I don't have any other name, but what I call it God consciousness. And um, I could talk about just that and what it's like <laughs> for, for, a long, for a long time, but um, to describe it and to give you a sense of what it's like is it's as if my awareness, my consciousness being lifted and opened up into um, this liquid state of omnipresence and, and, and simply energy and direct knowingness of, oh, I, I am all that. I am... Mm -hmm. I'm 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 this universe. I am I am I am I am and who am I? I am. <laughs> and being there for like extended periods of time is like it, it was quite an overwhelming experience yet an experience of pure pleasure and almost like giggles of like oh that's what the nature of reality is that's who i am and what inevitably follows that is this gradual dissension towards this tiny pale dot that is somewhere very far away sort of towards the bottom that is my human life so it's as if like there's this gradient of frequencies uh, between my human life all the way to the God consciousness and me experiencing the, the, the pinnacle being at the, at the top of that, um, uh, I don't know, rainbow of possibilities. I, as I start to descend towards my human life and back into my body, there are all these thoughts of like, oh, how do I remember? Mm -hmm. How do I continue to embody this uh, sheer grandiosity of who I am living life as a simple human? Like, how do I walk on this earth remembering all of this? And how do I relate to others knowing yes. that I am I'm a god? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and all kinds of emotions, all kinds of things and visions and and only to find myself like hours later in back in in the body with these remembrances and memories of what has transpired and 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 just marvel at it all like it and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that it's that knowingness you know and and DMT brings me there the quickest and deepest, but I absolutely find it on ayahuasca and, and on shrooms as well. This reminder of like, yes, yes, you are the divine and you are playing this character, you are playing this avatar. And you ask a good question, how do we bring that back? How do we integrate that experience and continue living the human life, but with an expanded awareness? Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's so sacred. When I when I touch on that in my heart, it's like oh, it's it, it, it. I cannot put it in words because it's the remembrance of that experience and how it felt in the moment is what's so precious. And and here I am, yet again in the human flesh. Not that omnipresent, omni like powerful essence that I felt being there. Yet I am. I know. I have experienced that. So how to yeah, how to bridge how to bridge that the human existence with the with the pure sacredness of 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 whatever this universe is. And I know that like simply like these days simply chanting mantras for example 
is is one of the most simplest ways to reopen into that awareness mm. and and feel directly the the presence of that divine energy while still remaining uh, very much grounded in the human form so to me it's been these series of experiences have created these precious reminders and memories that that help me with like in my day to day when uh, i go through turbulences and different emotions just touching on that mm. just like ah yes i am that what i'm experiencing right now and i am that also that pure light of divinity like i nobody can take away that experience from me when you go through a turbulent time in life how do you reconnect with that god essence <laughs> these days the most simplest one is the one that i already mentioned which is part of my morning practice is is simply chanting something happened in um, in the three bufa ceremonies that i had before i reopened the ayahuasca container that connect me like plugged me in directly into that of which you know the the ancient hindu teachings speak all these energies of shiva shakti krishna and it's not no longer mere words but energetic essences that i'm directly familiar with so when when i chant mantras that's what i open up into and uh, and when i see videos like when i watch videos for example of people doing kirtan like i can see it in their eyes like it's 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 there they feel it too and we don't even have to talk about it but something in that technology of sound the technology of mantras it just plugs me in it's fascinating isn't it well what do you think it is about mantras that activates that and is there a mantra or resource you recommend for the listeners to to pursue or to explore if they also want to have the same experience yeah i think this is where it gets interesting because time and time again i learned that there is no one single path for a soul to follow there is no recipe there is no formula and um but it is useful sometimes to see other people's recipes. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And what I would say is it's definitely worth trying out the most basic uh, mantras that um, are practiced at each and in any kirtan. Yeah, what I would say at the simplest form is if there's any part of you as you listen to this that kind of goes ah that's interesting simply take yourself out to a kirtan session and just sing the mantras that they sing mm -hmm. and see which ones resonate with you most and see what kind of experience you have just try it <laughs> just try it james just try it. just take this and try it. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the title of this episode just try it <laughs> try the bufo try the ayahuasca yeah. try the mantras <laughs> and i and i think it's also important to stay sensitive to what the call of the soul is and not just do it just because like oh you know like i'm just gonna go and consume all of these substances and, and see what happens but really feel into it first like feel into what's what's desired next mm -hmm. and not hurry not hurry because i think that's what i appreciated most about you is that you took your time you took your precious time of contemplation and it took you months to to finally open up into into the journey that you're on right now and that would be my suggestion as well like don't rush feel into it and see what's the most aligned next step is yeah i love how you put it the call of the soul yeah to really tune in like is this calling me and i remember i'm so grateful that by the time i reached ayahuasca i had felt the call 
to do it, but also I'd done all these other plants that prepared me in a way for it. You can never really truly be prepared, but it it had laid the foundation, the groundwork. And there was now this burning desire of, I am ready for this. I want to experience this. There was no hesitation. Nervousness, yes, but no no hesitation in the desire. And that was a that served me powerfully in the ceremony, uh, the first ayahuasca ceremony, because whatever happened, I was fully with it, you know, fully committed to it. Yeah. Yeah, because it's these medicines are super powerful allies and not mm-hmm. to be taken lightly. <laughs> Absolutely. What was the call of the soul that led you to Bufo years back? Hmm. Oh, it was um it was quite fascinating. At the time I was um going through a pretty intense period of grief from a breakup um with a partner of three and a half years. And um before even considering any medicines, like I in all honesty, I wasn't even thinking about it. But I felt the call to dive deeper into the hmm, what to call it the energetics of the relations between the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And so my first step was that actually led then directly to to going and uh, sitting with the Bufa was a, a tantra. Hmm, we can call it like a tantra massage however it was more than that it was a ceremony it was a ritual with a woman trained in in tantric uh, traditions and it opened me up enough to then receive the invitation from that same woman to consider bufa because she's connected also with the medicines and when she brought that possibility up i was like oh yes like I've been hearing about it for some years. One of my friends became a practitioner and uh, who serves Bufo, and I've been following her journey. And up until that moment, I haven't even considered. Yet, after the tantric ritual and my energy being reopened and having received that invitation, the answer was yes. And interestingly enough, what happened during that very first encounter with Bufu was exactly that. From the very second, from the very first inhalation, I got plopped into this world of of liquid energy and this mysterious dance between the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And what to say about it? It was um, so real and so juicy and so intricate and so loving and uh, playful at the same time that um, Mm. (laughs) that it um, I think was the first step that opened me up yet again for what was to come next which was actually aligning quite randomly or shall we say synchronistically with embarking on the on the journey of a tantra teacher training for for some months pretty much like a, a month after i first set with with bufo so somehow some way the theme let's say of sexuality the sexual energy kundalini being opened in peru some 6 years ago has now been leveled up and I opened up into it uh, with a completely different awareness with from a completely different state of consciousness and um and that's the journey I'm on right now and you know, just somehow it's all for me personally very very entangled and related mm mm you mentioned the divine masculine and the divine feminine. Yes. And I know something that's alive for you right now is creating spaces for the feminine and the masculine to come together and experience deep connection 
intimacy and as you put it new or forgotten ways to relate to each other yes can you talk about that yes um through my personal experiences and through the experiences of those around me time and time again i see how much how much we carry how much baggage we have as humans that keeps coming up in our relationships and um, there are layers of course to this there are multi-generational traumas or i don't know centuries millennia old things such as patriarchy for example and everything that it's done to suppress the feminine and there are more personal things uh, and so much time and energy is spent in relationships fighting things out so it's like it's this it's this war that goes on at different levels day in and day out between partners between the feminine and the masculine to to what end to essentially assert being right to assert that you know my wounds are bigger than yours and to completely disconnect ourselves from each other because even a single occurrence of something like a resentment is enough to 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 destroy any possibility of intimacy and uh, what is of interest to me is to find the ways and in some context i see them as new ways and in some context i see them as long forgotten because i do believe from the visions that i've seen that people women and men have lived together in this way before when they were so connected they they, they stayed so present with each other that that that's what mattered what mattered is to stay in connection and to work things through as opposed to going into the responses of war and being right and and going back and forth at each other so having felt acutely like from my own experience the the just the, the the deep sadness as a result of these encounters with with my own partners and having seen that happen in the relationships of those around me i've just i've come to the place of okay enough like people enough <laughs> and uh, and i first arrived at it personally to like even at that very first encounter with the tantric practitioner that then led to other things like bufo and ayahuasca i've i've basically come to lay down my arms like as in i no longer want to fight i no longer want to be in a state of war with the feminine like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no no and that's the invitation that i keep making on a day-to-day -day basis in in situations that happen around me is that there are other ways to relate as opposed to fighting even at the subtlest levels in the spaces that i'm creating are the spaces for men for example to open up their hearts and share what's going on in their lives and then to ask for what they need and receive potentially the possibilities or even the advice on how how to move in these difficult situations when the invitation is to either go into war or to stay in connection 
and as well as the spaces where the feminine and the masculine work directly with each other through the practices of Tantra. And without saying a word, have the experience of deeply connecting to each other and feeling the love and the intimacy flowing heart to heart. And um, my intention and my hope is that going through these experiences creates the possibility of healing uh, within ourselves and um, the possibility of laying down the arms and stopping the fight and starting to to relate in in new ways mm. yeah mm, beautiful i would love to dive into how we can relate in new ways to others and how do we stay connected when there is the option of war in your life how has that played out and can you talk about a time in your life where you had to choose war or staying connected and and some of the new ways of relating that you have found for yourself that keep you connected yeah the first thing that i'm going to say is that it's a roller coaster it, it like just because i have the intention of okay no more war it doesn't mean that it does not happen <laughs> it simply means that with each and every encounter there's more and more awareness of what's going on so the next time a particular kind of conflict happens in my experience it becomes easier and usually happens quicker to realize what's going on i love that more and more awareness yeah more and more it's like with each and every encounter there's 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 like a a quicker um uh, path that's being made to like realization that oh okay i'm in the middle of a war right now even though it looks like it's just you know poking each other mm -hmm. it's still mm -hmm. a low level war going on also the awareness of like oh i've been here before mm -hmm. and i know what not to do <laughs> so yeah. let me try something new yeah and what i would say about that there is of course you know um uh, there are many, many things that we can dive into in different layers to explore. But I think one super important intention and realization to start out with is that everything we conceptualize within ourselves, in our brain, is a story, essentially. So whatever is going on in a particular situation is a simply is simply an act of creating a story. So something is happening and we're looking at it, we're collecting all the pieces, all the evidence of what's going on, and we're assembling a story on the fly. Now, the kind of story we end up assembling deter is determined by so many things and primarily by how we grew up, what kinds of decisions we made along the way, about the world and how it works and other people and how they relate so it's it's highly it's a highly skewed story based on essentially how we assembled ourselves as a as a as a point of consciousness that perceives reality so whenever there is a situation of a conflict or war it's very likely that what is going on is that the two parties are creating the stories that they have told themselves before. And they stop relating to each other based on what's actually going on in the moment, but they start to relate to each other based on the stories. It's as if this person in front of you suddenly transforms into this character in your story and like, oh, you're doing this to me. <laughs> yes. And I've, you know, it happened to me before. And like, and da, 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 da. so like just that, just the realization that, okay, we as humans are story makers and those stories are highly biased based on how we put ourselves together along the way. And simply saying like, okay, I'm having a story of such and such. And it's very likely it has nothing to do with you, mm. person in front of me. And um, 
that immediately creates space of possibility, sort of like, like, a, like a gap, a gap of um, mm, in some way, I see it almost like a gap of lovingness between the, the two characters that are trying to fight it out. And, um, and it creates a possibility for something else, as opposed to continuing to relate to each other in the moment based on the stories that are also being created in the moment. There's just suddenly a possibility of like, oh, okay, wait a second. I am creating all of this narrative about you and what's going on and you creating all of this narrative about me and what's going on and yet we're just these two humans sitting in front of each other so what i also find is super helpful in situations like that is bringing the awareness like okay i am having a story but then also stopping to narrate that story in whatever words that are coming out of our, out of our mouths and then simply touching each other and simply connecting on the physical and energetic level without the mind being in between. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I guess, one thing I could say about all of that. Because when you, when you touch or connect on a physical or energetic level, you're not including the story in that. It's yeah. just it's just feeling your partner. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of ties into psychedelics even because I feel like one of the core aspects of a psychedelic trip is the story that you have in your sober day-to-day -day life falls away and you're given access to more layers, uh, deeper layers of truth beyond the day-to-day -day reality but actually it's a day-to-day -day story. Yeah. And it's interesting, you're touching there on something that I've been kind of wrestling with, which is being in, a, in an altered state, being with the medicine is so super real and so rich and so unlike anything you experience in a day-to-day in -day reality. And... Yeah, how much of it is the quote-unquote truth? Like, I've been actually wrestling with that because sometimes the stories, or the visions, rather, that are being painted during the during a trip are just so detailed, so vivid, as if I'm, like, in a brief moment of time, living um, like an entire life of mm -hmm. possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then this other particular part that I've been wrestling with is that once I'm back, once I'm integrating what has happened, like how much of that do I take on board quite literally? I know that myself personally, I have this tendency of um, taking things very literally so whatever whatever is being presented during a trip my temptation is, would be like oh my god this is like a prediction a premonition this is like a direct advice for me i need to do this and do, 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 do. and and i'm also learning that all of this is it's almost like um, this beautiful artwork that is being presented to me to paint possibilities to to bring something to the surface that otherwise I may not be aware of. Yes, possibility came to my mind too when you were talking that perhaps everything is a story. So the psychedelic visions that are so vivid and so real are in a sense also stories, but they are creatively different than what you, the stories that we live with day to day. And they open up that door of possibility. You know, I also struggled with this one time where the mushrooms kept showing me a specific person. And I I was so convinced that, oh, this is the relationship <laughs> that was, was meant to happen. <laughs> and it kept not happening or happening in a way that was 
totally not the intention <laughs> and i was like what the hell mushrooms you showed me this vision crystal clear of how this was supposed to play out and it's not playing out that way and it was something i wrestled with for a little while because the mushrooms have never betrayed me is something i come back to every time they've shown me things it's always served me it was never there was never any manipulation, let's say. But then equally, I had to realize, well, the visions I'm being shown are not, they're possibilities. They might be pointing at a frequency possibility, not a specific person. Mm. But the reason that specific person came up in the vision was perhaps it was the closest thing in that moment in my mind. And so the symbol of that person it showed up as that as that person. But in fact, it, it's all symbols and the frequency and the message is more important than the the detail of who or what something is. And so another way I like to think of it is like you're being shown different timelines. This could happen. This could happen. And you when you come back to reality, you then have to work on that. If you really want that timeline, you've got to keep planting the seeds and, and moving that direction. But just being shown the timeline does not equate to it being mm. uh, real or must happen or a prophecy yeah. of some kind. Yeah, this is beautiful. Yeah, this is kind of rounding off the corners of, of what I've been working with. So thank you for, for, these, for, for this uh, point of view on this, yeah. Because it was, it was funny. It was like, what the hell, mushrooms? You, you told me this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's that's the temptation that that I also had uh, uh, after having the visions that I did. And they don't call um, ayahuasca uh, pinturera for nothing, which is you know the 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 painter, the mm. uh, the artist. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think she she. Um, likes to paint possibilities and um, yeah and then we get to decide which which stories to pursue and one other note that I want to make around the stories is that it's not bad to have stories it's just that there are different kinds of stories some stories are more on the disempowering side of the spectrum and some stories are more on the empowering side of the spectrum so if everything is a story and you get to choose which story to mm -hmm. create then depending on the results that you want to experience you can choose either a disempowering story or an empowering story and and that makes a difference neither is bad or good and it does seem that I do experience this level of deep knowingness and truth on psychedelic trips. So even with the stories and the visions, there's some core aspect of it that feels undeniably true. And I wonder if you mm -hmm. if you also relate to that. Uh, sometimes that sense is so deep, um, especially in the most recent ayahuasca ceremonies. I, I had these visions of ancient times and like living through those ancient times and how it was and in what beautiful harmony we as humans used to live as well as the deepest sadness and grief over the things we have done to each other mm. and and not necessarily even knowing all the facts of what transpired but just feeling the deep truth of oh wow how much there is in that one particular you know blob of information and sort of receiving it as one instantaneous download and then not needing to know the details but simply knowing that now I'm in a position of letting it go and purging it and leaving it in the bucket and not purging it for myself personally, purging it for the people in the room, purging it f for humanity. And 
these kinds of experiences I've had time and time again when when the deepest truth of what has happened in the past just washes over me and and the next uh, best step that feels right in the moment is to re-remember it and let it go and purge it and let it dissipate and into the I don't know, recycling um, facilities of the universe. <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. In your day-to-day life, when you encounter grief or deep sadness, how do you transmute that? Mm-hmm. How do you work with those feelings? I would say there are at least two stages to that process. The first stage is to fully allow yourself to experience what you're experiencing. There is uh, this story that the mainstream culture has is that there are, you know, bad feelings and there is good feeling. Therefore, when you're experiencing quote unquote bad feelings, you need to somehow quickly do something in order to feel good again. So my invitation around that would be to actually create as much space and time as needed for you to fully dive into the sadness or the anger or the fear and just really allow it to experience. At the very least, begin with noticing what's going on and making the conscious choice of not labeling it as, oh, there it is again, bad. I think for many of us, that would be the the first simplest step. And then as you unfold your journey on that path, you can then open up into a deeper healing around that. Because usually when you're experiencing that, it's a pointer to something that wants to be healed within you. So trying to suppress it, is essentially delaying the the healing that your your bodies are asking for. And the act of transmutation happens through the deep experience of what it is that is moving through you. And letting it, like allowing it to play out completely so that there is nothing nothing left to hide or suppress and then there are of course different processes that are guided by space holders that allow you to move through that uh, in a more directed way and and get to the healing result results quicker so is there a process that comes to mind uh, there is a uh, one particular process that I am super familiar with that uh, I've experienced many, many times over the past um, year and a half, and it's simply called emotional healing process. If you want to look that up, it comes from, or it came to me through the game world of possibility management, which is this vast uh, world of copyleft techniques that um, also include working with the emotions and uh, healing them. And it's um, it's free to use. There are also communities of people who practice that with each other. And what I am also finding is that it can be so super intense that there is just inevitable inner resistance to like not doing it because it takes you to such depths that um, um, I think only naturally we, we, we tend to avoid that. And of course there are other um, techniques such as breath work mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. tapping or somatic release that are available. The The main point being here is that Acknowledging that what you're going through is not bad. That just like removing the label of, oh, you know, I should not be feeling what I'm feeling. And then from the, moving from that 
space into, oh, and how do I heal that? And then finding the aligned techniques to work with that. In the six years since you've done your ayahuasca journeys, what would you say has been the biggest challenge or the theme that keeps coming up for you to work on and heal and work through? Hmm. And how have you navigated that challenge? Hmm. I think the most potent story that comes up for me that I started working with some years ago now with and I worked through the layers and yet it's still quite present is this notion of receiving interactions with other people that very clearly indicate to me that you know how I am is not okay like it's it's a big big story in my life in other words there I am you know going about my daily business making the decisions that I'm making. And then all of a sudden there's a per person pops up in front of me who says, oh, what you're doing is actually not needed, not necessary, maybe even wrong. Um, ironically enough, I've been hearing a lot of that specifically around my work with ayahuasca recently. There's like multiple people who would just pop up on my path who would say like, oh, you know, like, all of this work with ayahuasca that you're doing, you're just, it's just spiritual bypassing. And, um, you know, you, the real work comes when you're sober. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, a double layer of, of that story that I just mentioned, you know, how I am is not okay. And what I'm, the choices that I'm making are not right. And, and yet more and more, I, relax into how I choose to live my life and um, into the steps that I'm taking. And to me, it's as simple as there is no universal answers to anything. Mm -hmm. You know, for some people, if they've come to the point in their life when they say, okay, psychedelics is spiritual bypassing and then no longer needed, okay. That's what works for you. However, it does not mean that I am personally done and complete working with these allies, mm -hmm. because to me, these allies are are continuing to help and unfold so much. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's again, it's not even necessary to engage in that level of like you know who is right and who is wrong. Because it makes no no sense. What matters to me is to continue to stay in relation, continue to connect and be curious about you know what each of us is up to and what sort of paths we're exploring without denying each other the the things that we are you know the choices that we're making for ourselves. It reminds me of something our mutual friend Steve talked about once, which is that the importance of trusting yourself above anyone else's opinion. Even when you make mistakes, you still must maintain that deep inner trust with yourself. Because what is the alternative to go through life not trusting yourself and outsourcing all your decisions to other people? Who, Who is to say that they are correct? So I like what you said that it's not about who is right or wrong. It's what is right for me? And tuning into the gut, tuning into that intuition over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And and even taking it, like kicking it up a notch and removing these labels of right and wrong and simply seeing these choices that we're making as experiments. Like mm, yes. I am in charge of my own laboratory of life yes. and I get to choose which experiments to embark on. So if I make an experiment and then I my lab explodes, oops, you know, like okay, I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll try again in the next lifetime. <laughs> I love that. I love the framing, you know, the word experiment. It's light, it's fun, it's lighthearted. It's we're not trying to take this so seriously. It's it's an experiment. And I'm experimenting with, for example, ayahuasca. 
Is it bringing me interesting results? If yes, continue. If not, stop uh, or try something new. And yeah, wow, experiments. I love that framing. I think everyone can can apply that to their life of don't take it so seriously and just see everything that you're doing as this grand experiment in the lab of your own mind, the lab of your life, the lab of your relationships, the lab of your, I mean, every area of life. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Circling back to the masculine and the feminine. Mm -hmm. What do you find the most fascinating about the feminine and the most confounding? Oh, (laughs) how much time do we have? (laughs) (laughs) Um, hmm. Yeah, there are these mysterious fundamental qualities or properties that these energies have. And... um, And I guess I should ask the same question about the masculine because that's yeah. you know to bring because it I back. mean it's a dense you know it's a dense it's not these are not the opposites these are very much complementary energies that are meant to find a way to unity again mm-hmm. and and that's why in our lives you know the the masculine seeks the feminine and the feminine seeks the masculine in different forms in in the energetic form and um i think the most puzzling and at times infuriating <laughs> quality of the feminine that i see is that just the sheer um vastness of the possibilities going on <laughs> at a single point of time it's as if like like the entirety of of the universe is like happening this second it's like and and me as the as the masculine my desire is like okay but can we just focus on this one thing <laughs> and that's you know that's i think that's one of the most basic interactions between the feminine and the masculine is that it is said that the the masculine is as the ultimate nothing what i mean by that is this it's this space of possibility that holds the everything which is the feminine so by definition the nothing is bigger than the everything because it contains it it's as if the masculine is this solid container creating the possibility for all kinds of creations to arrive so that the feminine gets to let go and just go into all kinds of explorations while the masculine is holding space for all of this to happen and then sort of on the opposite or end of this scale of possibilities when the feminine gets into the weeds of oh my god so much is happening the masculine can also step in and sort of trim the garden and um, <laughs> <laughs> and rearrange things and and make it more clear and structured again and and that's 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 one of the most i think beautiful uh, interactions between the feminine and the, and the masculine is that the, the 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 nothing holding space for the everything to unfold and it's also the most difficult thing i find for the masculine is just to be with this vastness of of the feminine and hold space for all kinds of emotions all kinds of possibilities and actually be there for that and not run away what is your favorite thing about the feminine <laughs> <laughs> the favorite uh i would say for me personally the the most favorable favorite and or i would say most desirable quality of the feminine is the the lovingness mm. just the sheer lovingness in the embrace into which i get to melt and disappear 
Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. We had a listener of the show send in some questions for you. And one of the oh, questions wow. <laughs> from Ranjana was, uh -huh. she finds it very interesting how you play in the space of open relationships while maintaining your equanimity uh -huh. and joy. And she, she knows how challenging open relationships can be. And so she'd love mm. to know, how do you manage open relationships? How do you flow in that space? What, what lessons and advice can you give to the mm. listeners? Well, the first thing I would say about all of that is that it's an ongoing experiment. <laughs> A roller coaster. Exactly. And it keeps bringing all kinds of results. And um, hmm. on one hand, it does help to have clarity of the containers that are being created in particular relationships, meaning having specific agreements and understandings of um, what it is that we're doing. And on the other hand, it does not guarantee that drama will not arise. On the contrary, I would say that continuing to move in multiple relationships at the same time creates more possibilities for different kinds of drama. What first drew you to that way of relating? Uh, I don't know if I had any choice, uh, meaning when I was um, in my first marriage and through a series of synchronicities, I found myself connecting with another woman. For me, there wasn't a choice of like, oh, now I need to decide. Do I stay with my wife or do I continue connecting with this other woman and leave my wife. For me, the most obvious answer was, oh, why not both at the same time? And that was many, 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 many years ago. At that time, I actually had no idea that such a thing exists as you know, open relationships or non-monogamy or any anything of that kind. And it took me another, I don't know, 13 years actually, and multiple other relationships to stumble on the piece of knowledge that such a way of relating exists again actually through our common friend steve and reading his blog that i discovered that such possibilities exist and what i'm continuing to learn from day to day is that it's not anything solid by any means it's it's like being in a relationship with one person, only experimenting with multiple people at the same time. <laughs> and I don't even know, like I don't, I don't have any solid answers. I have days when, when I'm like, oh, it would be so much easier to just like focus on one person and like forget about everybody else. But what I keep coming back to and that's to answer your question is that I've come to learn that for me personally, it's important to keep my heart open. Mm -hmm. In what way? To keep it open to whoever's in front of me at any given moment. And it's either a blessing or a curse uh, yet to be determined. Yet that's the only way to live my life that I have found that continues to work. Is that... I find myself in front of a person, we are connecting, we are relating right here, right now, and that's what matters. Mm. Mm. What have been the challenges, would you say, the biggest challenges of open relationships? I would say the number one is not surprising, which is jealousy. And um, where do you think jealousy comes from? I have a sense that jealousy is a particular kind of reaction um, 
that has to do with how we value ourselves and how we perceive we are valued by others. So there is this sort of sense of how do I matter? Like how much do I matter to you? And um, and there's a very real fear, which is not to be underestimated, and not to be judged by any by any means, that is present for many, many people. When, when you observe your partner, the person who you're deeply intimate with, interacting with other people, like a lot of stuff comes up in that moment. The baggage. Yeah. And it seems to me that's, that's one of those choices that each of us gets to make, whether to work with it and find out what's actually going on within that or to simply and that's not wrong by any means and not bad create relationships in which the possibility of let's say jealousy being triggered is minimized mm -hmm. and and that's what typically i think the container of a monogamous relationship provides is that ah i can relax and not even think about it however i think the reality is a little bit different because even in monogamous relationships the the topic of jealousy is quite uh, alive a lot of the time you bring up a good point that i think actually applies to many areas of life where in my life when i look at challenges or problems i'm facing i have those two choices go deeper into this challenge and see what's there or mm -hmm. This is not a priority right now, so I'm going to minimize the triggers around this, knowing full well that I'll have to circle back to this eventually. But at the moment, not a priority. We're going to minimize the interaction with this and keep moving on. And I think that's a case-by-case, challenge-by-challenge decision of go deeper and unravel this now or minimize the triggers. And it seems yeah. like with relationships for many people, they are choosing to just let's minimize the triggers here. Yeah, and um, and I think it's important to recognize the choice being made here. Mm -hmm. It's it's not bad. No, it's it's not better to go into the trigger and find out. It's just that the results are going to be different. Meaning that at some point you're going to have to figure out what's going on there. Um, I would even say, you know, if not in this lifetime, some other <laughs> lifetime. I think eventually we get to sort out all of these things, hopefully. <laughs> and um, the choice is yours. Not bad, not good. You, as a person, are making the decisions. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not better to have open relationships. If anything, I think it's a, just a yet another. Um, kind of fast lane approach to personal development because it multiplies the challenges uh, within you know a shorter period of time so mm -hmm. i think to me it's one of the appeals as well to just like really walk the edge of what's possible in in relating with jealousy how how far have you unraveled that for yourself and what lessons have you learned around that Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. As I continue to observe myself, most of the time, I, I'm very at peace with the people that I connect deeply with, connecting with other people. It's as if I actually partake in in their happiness of relating with others, and I, I just feel the freedom of. Ah, I love you, mm. and I want you to be free. Like for mm. me, that's sort of the ultimate mantra that most recently I got reminded of uh, from from the tantra training that I've gone through, and and ultimately that's that's the approach with which I want to live my life. Is that I want to be deeply connected, deeply intimate, in love and in relation and 
completely allowing 100% freedom to the other to do whatever it is that interests them in life. Like, who am I to say what to do and not to do? Who to connect with and who not to connect with? Like, it's not my life. I can, I can decide that for myself, but I cannot decide that for the other, even though that person might be my closest ally and partner and everything. So, and I have um, also felt what I would call like little stings of like, um, oh, like what is it about me that um, is less appealing that causes you, person over there, to connect more with the others than me? So it's like, it's again, like back in that space of like self-worthiness and comparison that really... Um, keeps coming back for me personally. So whenever I feel the stings of jealousy and become aware of them, usually that's that's where the, the root um, of it is. It has to do with kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm like missing out on something. I'm not good enough or something, something, something. Have you found a way to navigate that? And what has your journey been like with self-worth? What lessons have you learned around that? One, one of the things that I found around that is that it helps to check in with myself to figure out what it is that I exactly want. Because usually it points towards, oh, I, I, maybe I want more time with that person. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, the the most obvious yet not so obvious step for most of us is actually asking for that, making the invitation. It's like, hey, I want I want to spend more time with you. Like, how about how about you know we'll spend this weekend just together, cuddling and watching movies and really reconnecting? I so want that. Are you a yes? And just that simple act of asking for what's desired again with the with the stipulation of not making an expectation out of it because there's like a sort of a double twist in there that if you ask for what you want and the other person says oh actually i'm a no for this at this time there's an there's like a deeper possibility to spiral down into oh you see i knew it <laughs> yes yes <laughs> so so there's this work of being at ease with each and every no that arrives. It's not mm -hmm. super simple. However, allowing the other person the freedom of the choice and allowing the self the freedom of making the continued invitations. And it may just be the case that multiple invitations will, will continue to yield no's and finally the, the alignment between these two souls will disintegrate and, and that's how it is. But really, there is no other choice but to continue to make invitations around the desires that we have and seek out those people who are a yes to that which we desire to co-create. So that's essentially that's 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 life making invitations for what you want to create and occasionally receiving yeses from some people and yay let's go let's play together you bring up two interesting points which is that so often we don't make the invitation there seems to be this resistance to making an invitation perhaps fear of rejection ties into that yeah, it's because, time. Yes. as you say, being at ease with every no that arises, we have not necessarily been trained to be at ease with no's. And we tend to avoid them or run away from them or not even make the invitation so we don't have to face the no. Yeah, that's a big one. Like you're bringing a really big point, which is like, oh, I would rather not make an invitation because if it's a no, like, oh my God, I'm going to feel so bad. Mm -hmm. And it's a practice. It's as simple as that. It's like, okay, just I'm inviting you to start making invitations so that you can receive so many no's that it it becomes an, a no biggie. It's like, okay, mm. it's a no. Thank mm -hmm. you for taking care of yourself. 
Um, that's, I think, the only way that I know of is just continued practice of receiving no's. And guess what? You, with more no's, you increase your chances of receiving yeses as well. But if you don't ask, if you don't invite, then that's a no by default. <laughs> How do you stay detached in your life? Because you have this Zen-like quality of being at ease with the yeses, at ease with the noes. Has that been a place that took many years to reach? Is it part of your character default mode settings? How do you tap into that detachment? Hmm. Detachment actually is a, is a biggie because on one hand, we as humans very much require attachment, mm. especially, you know, when we are little babies. Like yes. If, if there is no attachment, what this means is death. You detach from life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are born into this world to create attachment. So if there is a safe, secure attachment between the baby and the mother, that's what essentially makes it possible for, for the baby to grow up and turn into an adult. Hmm. And yet, detachment is so important to an adult because it helps us to create the freedom of, of choice for each other so that we're at any given moment we're living our highest truth and and that's when it's worth mentioning that a lot of relationships thrive on a particular kind of attachment that feeds our mutual traumas mm. and insecurities so there's this whole, you know, topic of secure attachment, insecure attachment, uh, different kinds of styles and whatnot. But really what I'm wanting to talk here about is is just more of a universal detachment from how things are unfolding and trusting that whatever flow that's being created is it's the best alignment at this time. So if, for example, I make an invitation and the answer is no, of course, one possibility is to agonize over it and go into like, oh my God, you know, like I should have not asked, now I have to live with this no, and that means that I'm not worthy, do, 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 do. What if like, okay, no means that for that person, this particular invitation is not aligned at this time, and ah, okay, I still respect you, I may still love you deeply, and I want you to be free. And um, I would say that somehow, some way, personally, for me, most of the time, it does come kind of by default. There is this, yeah, like you said, some settings <laughs> that were uh, somehow programmed in that allow me to be at this, at this level of like, oh, okay. And it's not like that 100% of the time. There are definitely situations when my own emotions, that is to say, sort of trauma of the past, gets triggered through that of like, oh, but I really, really, really wanted it. And it's a no. Uh. And then what unfolds is essentially the work of, okay, so what is actually going on? Like, are you working with the situation that is present here and now, or you're simply rehydrating something from the past that is that you that I'm being reminded of this time. And that's simple a pointer to something within me that still wants to be healed. So if there is a reaction, there is a wound. If there is a reaction, there is a wound. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a flow of of signals and uh, possibilities to to dive deeper into and um, one thing that helps with all of that is continually coming back to self and assuming that what is happening 
is what I'm creating. Uh, otherwise, it's like it's this very basic notion of interacting with the world. You can be interacting with the world from a position of reacting to what's happening and essentially being a victim to to the circumstances and and then going through emotions around that, oh, you know, like why did this happen to me, etc. Not bad, but it continues to create this position of not being able to do anything about it until the world around me changes. And that's okay. It reminds me of something you taught me, which was to stay in your center. Yeah. When there's turbulence, it means that your your center has been shifted to, to bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Exactly. Because if you are reacting to the world, typically it means that you just throw your center to whatever situation is happening and it's over there and you're like observing it and you're helpless. You can't do anything about it. However, the other way is to bring it home, to bring your energy and attention home to yourself and move from that place as the creator of your life and assume responsibility for everything that's happening. Somehow, some way, I'm creating this. Hmm. What this does, it puts you right into the driver's seat of like, okay, since I'm creating this, what do I want to create next? And how do I go about it? As simple as that. And the results of that is that you you can then like explore, oh, you know, I can do this, I can do that, and da 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 da. So you can you have an infinite number of experiments to run as opposed to waiting for the world to change. When you have an infinite amount of experiments to run and an infinite amount of things to explore, how do you choose which things to pursue and which things to delay or not pursue at all? Quite often I just check in with myself and there's this sense of alignment or misalignment that arrives. And even in cases when I override the perceived misalignment with my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm still going to do this experiment. Quite often I find out later on down the road that, oh, actually, you know, my initial assessment of it being misaligned was right. However, it was a fun experiment. So, um, and I, I received certain results from that. It's like this saying that you cannot make a mistake because each and every path you take is inevitably bringing you some kind of results and uh, and you learn from that. It's like you, you continue to refine what it is that you want to create with each and every, uh, you know, dead end, so to speak, uh, that, that you explore. And um, not bad. It's, you know, it continues to to sharpen the the sense of what you really want to create in life. You remind me of a comment someone left on one of my YouTube videos. The video was titled, Keep Going. But the comment said, well, I've tried so many things for 10 years. They basically alluded to so many dead ends that they've, they're have they giving up hope. What would you mm -hmm. say to someone who is maybe experiencing an enormous amount of dead ends or perceived time length of, of stuckness, mm -hmm. what, what can they do in that situation? Mm, the first thing that comes to mind is just, yeah, drop down to the deepest bottom you can, as in, okay, yeah, you've tried all you could and, and that's the results that you've received and just really being with that. Because I think quite often what arrives is that, oh, you know, I've explored all of this and I still haven't gotten anywhere and it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. It's because there's this inner friction of what the desired result was and what the actual results that arrived. So giving yourself the permission to simply say that, huh, I tried, 
and I got nowhere, and that's where I'm at. So the simple admission of sort of looking at your life as a map and seeing that this you know coveted prize or treasure somewhere's over there, yet you are over here. Mm-hmm. And admitting the simple truth of, okay, I tried my best and I got nowhere and here I am. Um, and making it okay for yourself to to experience that very bottom of of the results that you received, and giving it some time and space, and then hopefully through that neutrality of okay, I you know quote unquote failed. Where where do I want to go next? Because. I mean, what else is there to do? You can you can check out from this life and you know try again in the next one. Many people choose that path as well, and you know myself personally, I don't judge that by any means. It's like okay, you're done playing. That's okay. However, if there's still you know some juice left, why not to try something else? I love what she mentioned about coming to that place of neutrality. And just letting the momentum of the past and whatever energies were stirred up from the trying to just recede and and the ripples to fade. And then from that stillness, now you can make a new choice. Rather than in the splashing around making ripples, trying to decide something. It's just first, get still, do nothing, become aware of where you are, how you're feeling, and then from that moment forth, make a new decision. Yeah, and even before you get to the place of neutrality, I I can see how much emotion that can be stirred up, how much sadness, grief, all kinds of stuff, and allowing that to play out as well. Because I think a lot of the friction arrives in this notion of, oh, I shouldn't be experiencing what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, and allowing yourself to experience what you're experiencing is, is the first step. Where do you think that feeling of, I shouldn't be experiencing this comes from? It's almost a little bit of an entitlement of reality. Why are you not giving me something? Mm -hmm. Or why am I not living a specific version of the life I thought I would be living? Yeah. But it's so relatable. Yeah. um, It makes me wonder if it's just um, a piece of thoughtware that was installed by kind of this modern culture of... Um, I don't know, the American dream or something like that, that, you know, this is what you're meant to do. You're, you're meant to succeed big time and, you know, prevail and live out all of your wildest dreams or something like that. Somehow, some way, it feels to me that it's fairly recent and maybe the people of the past were more humble around the experiences that they were going through and more trusting the divine flow of things. Mm. So, yeah, that's kind of my best sense at this time is that it's just a, it's just a feature of modern culture and uh, sort of programming towards, you know, uh, an attitude of a, um, like living living the American dream or something like that, yeah. I love the word thoughtware. <laughs> what do you think has been the thoughtware or app that you've installed this year for yourself? Mm. Somehow, very tangibly, there is this shift that occurred from a highly theoretical attitude towards certain spiritual practices, such as, you know, like um, the the tools, like I mentioned, mantras, towards, oh my goodness, it's it's such a direct gateway into divinity. So that's a very marked change that was facilitated by, by the plant medicines so no no longer do I have to think of things like uh, mantras as useful tools and that will you know bring about some kind of results long term. 
it's a very marked shift of, okay, all I need to do is just sit down first thing in the morning and chant, and there it is. I'm just smiling while being embraced by the divinity. <laughs> mm. Mm. Beautiful. Tell me about your first Burning Man and what that meant for you and what it shifted for you. Oh my God, that crazy place. <laughs> <laughs> It's by far the craziest, wonderful, spectacular creation of humans that I've discovered. And um, what to say about it? It's the most beautiful experiment that humans have undertaken. It's a community of 80,000 people coming together and building a city out of dust for a week and, um, and doing all kinds of wild experiments and having fun and um, relating, relating to each other in ways that is quite rare in the so-called default world. Burners call it, call the, you know, the, the regular level of reality, the default world. And there is this thing of coming back to the default world and decompressing after, after the burn. Because it takes, it's as if like, as if you're on a one or two week trip of most amazing experiences. And then you return into the land of, you know, shopping malls and people shouting at each other. And, and you're like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> like, because out there in the desert, It's, it's the most heart opening um, being to being kind of experience that, that I've had. And it has the magical quality of bringing you the experiences that you most need at that time. It's the most, it's like the highest density a place of synchronicities that I've experienced, the most incredible things that just are improbable happen there. You know, the, the, the easiest example of that would be you're like in the middle of the desert and you just proclaim, oh, it wouldn't be nice to have a, I don't know, a glass of champagne right now. And not a second later, there's a person driving by on the bicycle, champagne, champagne, something like that. Wow. And... Um, Maybe also the intentions of the 80,000 people create this incredible uh, sphere of energy that is very much interlocked. So the synchronicities happen yes. very quickly, very instantaneously, because there is this like a hive energy of, of, of openness to miracles and synchronicities. Yes, exactly that. It's as if once you cross the line into the territory of the city, you just open up to anything mm. and somehow you know 80,000 people doing that at the same time it creates this magic bubble just like you said of most improbable things happening and the most fun things happening as well it's it's such a huge playground adults just open up and play in all kinds of ways and you can find Anything you seek there, from the most spiritual things to the most, um, you know, wild, such as, you know, orgy dome and whatnot. And there's an experience for everyone. And um, I don't know what else to say about it other than go and experience it, try it out. <laughs> you said it gives you what you most need. What did it give you, that first experience, or, or maybe even the recent one? Yeah, it's sort of like an ongoing journey. But interestingly, for the, my first uh, Black Rock City, uh, the, the Big Burn, as they call it, in, in the Nevada desert, what it brought to me is one of the most significant relationships of my life, which happened right after 
the very first person that I met right after was the person that I spent the next three and a half years with and traveled um, around the world and worked all kinds of relationship um, issues and have grown so much. While being, though, at the first burn, I was more of a, like, walking around like a kid with my, you know, jaw to the ground, like, like what is this place? <laughs> what is this place? Like, I remember just hearing myself say that oh, over and over again, because it's just, like, it's so wild and so extraordinary that... Um, that just makes me want to go there again and again. So I have not missed one since the first time I went in 2019. Besides the the the, the rogue burn that happened sort of um, spontaneously and um, was not curated by the Burning Man organization that usually organizes it. This recent one was... Uh quite interesting wasn't it because of the floods and i'm so curious how how for you it was and what you learned from this recent burn yeah it from what i heard it never happened before like there were a few years when uh, just a you know brief rain would come and create a bit of mess but um it would quickly dry out and that was that this year uh, the weather has been quite wet even before the burn, so the ground was saturated and it even delayed the entry when we arrived there for the build week to, to build the camps. Um, we had to delay by three days before arriving to the playa because it was um, raining as well. What was most fascinating about it is to observe the reaction of the outside world. Like we woke up in the morning and everybody's like, oh, we're like, we're national news. We're like international news. Everybody's talking about Burning Man and how, you know, how stuck we are here, how we're like eating human flesh here and, uh, you know, no food, no water. And, uh, and we're like, ha, 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 you know, like right there. It's just such an example of how centralized, um, uh, centralized uh, the, you know, the, the news um, are um, so centralized and centralized oh yes <laughs> and the interesting tidbit about that is that our camp uh, is pretty big it's about 300 people and part of the infrastructure that we have is the showers and it just so happened this year that I was part of the three men team who built the showers for our camp and then I learned that one of our campmates, a lady, did an interview with the CNN where we, where she actually showed the showers that we built, and within the first day, the the video clip of you know the showers that we built it received like something like fifty million views on on CNN. <laughs> so it was an interesting um, tidbit of. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a synchronicity, but it's just like you know, there it is. The showers that we built just a week ago are world famous, you know, national or world famous news. Um, so, so that was one aspect to see the reaction of the external world of like, oh, you know, like those burners, like they 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 had it coming and now they're like suffering and whatnot. All the while, we're there having so much fun, <laughs> dancing in the mud, having these you know post apocalyptic dance party of parties of these barrels burning with fire and us gathering around it and just music blasting the DJs are going and we're just like like you painting <laughs> our faces with mud and just like having so much fun and and it brought people together because a lot of people stayed in in their camps instead of going out and you know having all kinds of playa adventures because it was raining so much because it was raining because it was muddy and and personally, I yeah, I also had this idea while it was raining, oh, hey, why not to do a, a tantra practice? So I invited uh, one new friend that I just met uh, the day before, and she's like, oh, and let's invite more people. I'm like, okay. And before I knew it, there was a group of 10 people who did tantra practices together for the next couple of hours. And then right when we finished, this most amazing double rainbow just came out. 
it was just like a miracle. <laughs> and on top of that, just this week, I heard from one of the friends who was part of that practice. And um, he lives in Montreal. And so he sends me this message. He's like, hey, remember this lady that I did the Tantra practice with? I'm like, oh, I don't exactly remember, but what about it? He's like, well, she's coming to visit me in Montreal and we're exploring a deeper relationship. And I'm like, magic. Like because there is something about specifically relations created on Playa because these bunches of magical people connecting and there's something super special about that. So so yeah, you know, the way it looked on the news was nothing like what it was mm. actually mm. going through that experience. And yeah, some people panicked and tried to get out and got stuck in the mud. There was a symbolism there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> instead of like, instead of going into the experience, they tried to escape and they got stuck and then they suffered because of that. <laughs> Almost like a psychedelic trip, you know, when you try to get out of the psychedelic container in the middle of yeah. it, you just end yeah. up making things more sticky. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there you go. <laughs> what was the biggest lesson that the playa gave you this year? Oh, the biggest lesson. Hmm. There was this a deep journey of solitude that unfolded amongst making deep contacts and relations with other people. There was also this sense of profound solitude and loneliness. Mm. And just being with that was like, oh, okay. Okay. Um like don't don't push and try to make something happen. Like be with what is. It's that's that's the alignment at this time. And uh, there was a lot of kind of sadness and desire to to have something else. And while it was not happening, just to the, the, the space of being with what is. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that the experience of loneliness often hits us when we're surrounded by lots of other people. Hmm. And we're yeah. maybe craving a one-on-one -on -one connection or, an, or a more intimate yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a deeper lesson around that is not, again, to label it, oh my God, you know, what are you doing in, you know, in this most magical place all by yourself? And not, not labeling it as bad or undesirable. The previous year you, you went with someone else Yes, which was amazing. Which was amazing, yeah. Yeah. And when you go alone, I guess it changes the flavor of how you experience Playa. Yeah, and it's it's one of, of interesting flows of of being at Burning Man is that a lot of people are there to connect and to experiment. And and part of that lesson was that okay, if things don't align, like why push? I push mm -hmm. for that. So like I would rather not to have an experience that than to have a misaligned experience. And maybe, you know, that's kind of cutting myself short from, you know, running some wild experiments, but that's how it was this year. Yeah. You know. What are your intentions for next year's burn? Next year it's interesting. Next year I'm for the first time in three years, I'm contemplating um camping with a different camp. And that's a kind of like a, a super difficult decision because I love the camp that I'm with, which is a live music camp. And getting to know people with each year deeper and deeper is also amazing. However, there's this other camp called Naked Heart, which the, the sole gift of which, and gifting is part, part of what Burning Man is about. There is no money. There is no exchange even, there is gifting. So there is camps who are gifting certain kinds of things. There are people who are gifting uh, things to each other. So this camp is gifting 
workshops and spaces and specifically tantric spaces that I'm super interested in holding. And it's in a larger village that also has camp contact, which is contact improvisation dance and ecstatic dance and all kinds of things that are so alive in my life right now. Mm. So it feels like a, like um like the next exploration to do and i wonder what it's going to be like to be a part of such a such a powerful space because on any given day there are like hundreds of people coming through and taking multiple workshops in parallel in different um, domes of this camp and it's just like it feels like so much transformation is happening and and i want to be part of that so that's my intention for the coming year i know one of the workshops or trainings that's had a big effect on you is expand the box training and mm -hmm. possibility management i think those yes. two go together what yeah. uh i'd love to to dive into that a little bit and for those who don't know what is possibility management and who is clinton callahan and what what was the impact that it had on you so clinton is um is the originator of this so-called game world and what is a game world is is just a space with specific pieces and um terms and and games that people play and um, the game world of possibility management is very much about self development and healing and expansion of consciousness and things that are possible and the most remarkable thing about it is that it's copy left it's available for free on the web there's a collection of 500 plus websites that are available for free on the web that people can explore however the most potent part of that game world are these trainings that are done in person and people come together for a week and go through a lot of different experiences and part of those experiences is the so-called thoughtware upgrades which is changing the way you might think about things upgrading the ways in which you think about things or like switching up the lenses with which you look at the world but also going through very tangible physical and energetic and emotional experiences of transformation while while relating to each other <laughs> and one thing that i can say about that is that go try it <laughs> it's um you know it's fairly affordable and there are multiple trainings that run um, in different places around the world it's become quite popular actually in europe predominantly interestingly enough however there are trainings that happen in the states as well as in mexico and um one of the goals of this game world is to essentially create a new culture the next culture the culture that arises when the matriarchy and patriarchy run out their course it's a new culture that brings together the archetypally initiated women and archetypally initiated men to collaborate with each other it's essentially this idea of of the feminine and masculine coming together into unity and um allowing their fundamental energies to collaborate as opposed to antagonize each other and and fight so that's one of the goals and it's interesting over the past year i've taken probably six different trainings each being one week long and then i kind of in the way overdosed on that so i've taken this year to integrate all of the all of the experiences that i had during these trainings and it's very much part of my day-to-day -day flows of how i interact with the world and how i 
relate to other people, and yet I haven't been active as part of the community that actually continues to move that game world forward. And um, I have a sense that maybe come next year, I might be able to reopen that container. But for now, all the experiences that I've had have been so rich and deep that, you know, it's taken me all this time to just work with it and integrate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, we can probably post some links, um, you know, in the description of the show for people um, who are interested to explore. But be warned that, you know, it's a deep, deep rabbit hole because there's just so much information and sometimes it's just so super overwhelming because so many edgy topics that are being touched on that are not present in our modern culture. It's an exploration. It's an experiment. Yeah, when I go on the the website, <laughs> every page has like, hundred links to other terms and then <laughs> yeah. those terms have a hundred links to other terms and yeah. i'm like yeah okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah yes yes and then there are different layers of it that are more compact uh, than others but yes it's a you know it's a it's a deep deep rabbit hole so take as little or as much of it as as you'd like and one thing is for sure that it's 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 super helpful for for shifting perspectives or even the ways of being. Sky, it's time for the lightning round. Lightning round? The lightning round. Well, <laughs> let's go. What are you most grateful to have experienced in your life? Mm, I'm most grateful for experiencing this deep sense of intimacy and, and union with another human being. It's so precious to me. Mm. Do you believe in destiny, fate, or free will? Mm. I think it's a collaboration. That's what I believe in. It's like there is there are different possibilities and invitations that are present in, in this environment. So some of it is sort of the hard, more hard landscape and some of it is definitely softer things that are within our free will. What is one life lesson you learned from your mom? Hmm. Persistence. Hmm. How did she teach you that? She was just so focused in and grounded in, in how she approached life that um it's it's amazing for me to to see this kind of focus of like okay this is what i want and this is what i'm doing what three words represent the core essence of who you are hmm. love clarity transformation mm. love clarity transformation love that who or what brings out your wild side? Eh, playful <laughs> humans. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> pair me up with a, another playful human and there is no limits to what kind of fun can be had. <laughs> what do you most value in your friends? Hmm... <sighs> the open-heartedness and the intimacy of the connection mm. just, yeah just sharing from from the from the bottom of the heart what is your favorite memory of our friendship <laughs> all the delightful conversations and just just the state of like whenever we come together especially during our time in vancouver just this bubble of delight and mutual enjoyment yeah one of my favorite memories is uh visiting you in the airbnb house in north vancouver and just mm -hmm. spending 
time there and enjoying our coffee and our chats and so precious yeah yeah what is one thing people would be surprised to learn about you that i can be quite shy really <laughs> you see i don't, i don't believe that <laughs> I don't buy that for a second. <laughs> What are you shy about? <laughs> oh, I mean, different things at different times. Yeah. I mean, it depends, you know, on on the flow of energy and whatnot. But yeah, I, th I think if you were to meet me when I was um, growing up, you would probably not recognize me at all. Like it's taken me years and years to sort of come out of the shell and be more open. But well, especially when I was like young, I would be just like, you know, somewhere in the corner reading a book and just super quiet, super by myself and just like, hey. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's a part of that that stays with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the most influential book that came into your life? Mm. I would say it's the book that I'm still halfway through and I'm hoping to finish. And that's a book by Clinton Callahan. And it's called Building Love That Lasts. Mm. Is it related to possibility management or it's a different yes it's also sort of like a compilation of many 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 things that um it's about and it's it, it has deeper aspects of it it's like a hmm, it's a compendium of wisdom from a man who lived through a lot of experiences what is your dream for the planet so that we may find ways of healing the relations between the feminine and the masculine and begin to collaborate in in ways possibly not seen before how do you envision that looking like hmm It's that thing that we've already touched on, which is laying down the arms of the war mm -hmm. and beginning with staying in connection in situations that we want to run away from or fight each other out in. Sky, it's been a beautiful conversation. I'm so grateful to have spent time with you and to continue to learn from your wisdom and your insights. And thank you for, for coming on the show. Mm. It's uh, my pleasure. And it's been the most amazing bubble of uh, just reconnecting with you. It's been a while. And uh, the way I'm feeling right now is as if I'm in in this space of pleasure and openness and flow and um i could probably continue for some hours <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for this invitation and um let's do that again sometime yes. when we are you know wiser and older <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me you are turning 50 next year oh jesus you had to say it didn't you <laughs> we, we don't have to say it <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. It's okay. Let's let it be known. It's the five O, the big five O coming. What have you what have you learned from five decades of life on this earth? And what would you tell your 18 year old self? Mm. Mm. I would say feel the fear and do it anyway would be one of the things. Like do more experiments and not that there is anything major going on, but do pay attention to your teeth. <laughs> 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 For some reason, I don't think it's that obvious to our younger versions, 
that you know it's it's super important <laughs> sky where can people find you if they would like to vibe with you i'd say instagram would be the, the best place which is sky blue uh, s-k-y-b-l-u dot earth and what is one final piece of advice that you want to leave the listeners with on how they can lead a more epic life just try it just try it i love it i love it <laughs> sky thank you thank you so much my pleasure it's been a pleasure yes, yes. and until next time thank you you've been listening to the james zander trip with sky blue Thank you so much to Sky. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast and learn from you and spend time with you and your wisdom. If you enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with one friend who you think might resonate with this conversation. And for more deep conversations, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Visit jameszander.com for all the links. Thank you for listening and have a beautiful day.